So I'm gonna use two amazing illustrations that come to us from scripture about the power of cultural language. And, and one's gonna be bad and the other one's going to be good. And I, I wanna take a look at, at, at how we communicate culturally as Christians and how we should communicate. The first story of, of cultural language comes to us from the story of the Tower of Babel. If you don't know either one of these stories, don't, hold on, I'll explain everything. What we have coming out of us as the book of Genesis is we're told that God comes upon the work of, of people and the industry of people in Genesis 11 and he finds them busy at work and he finds uh, what they're working at and he watches over and he takes a look. He's interested to see how we build. And I think he's still interested right now at this particular moment in America on how we're building. What is our cultural language? What are we saying? What, what, what is the quality of the construct that we're putting together? So let's jump into the story in Genesis. Now the whole people had one language and the same words. And then the people said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top into the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse our language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. What a story. I, but I know what you're thinking, and, and, and I thought it too. Why would God mess this up? I mean, with my American mind, I just look at this like, we got progress happening here. We got development going on here. We got a, su a new subdivision being built. You know, why would you want to get in the way of, of something like that? I mean, after all, I mean, one language, one purpose, one mind. I mean, isn't that, isn't unity the end game? Um, isn't the elimination of diversity the way to produce the best society? Huh. Well, that's not, nothing that God ever said. We might have heard that in Aryan philosophy from Adolf Hitler. See, it really matters what kind of society you're busy trying to build. What is the culture of the society that we're trying to build today? that you're trying to build, that I'm trying to build? What is its goals? What is its motives and objectives? I know this, if you're looking to make a name for yourself and for your kind, then surrounding yourself with people who speak only the language that you speak and have your vision, well, that's the way to go. Surround, surround yourself with people that are just like you. Surround yourself with people that got your language and, and have your vision. If you're looking to create something for you and for your people group, that's what you do. But that was not the society that God had put man on the earth to create. And that's why God steps in. We need to remember, unity does not always equal love. We may share language of political correctness and enforce it with censorship against anybody who speaks against us, but that doesn't mean it is the right kind of society. I have, I have been in too many conversations in too many places where we in public are, are uh, politically correct, but whispering um, things that should not be said in private. Just because we may be unified does not mean that the heart is good. Just because people come together with one voice, one word, and one thought, and one vision, doesn't mean love is present. So in this story, the single tongue and the, um, the uh, ho homogenic society is intentionally confused by God and then dispersed. It's so amazing to me. You know, I had never noticed that before, you know, because we kind of get on this thing about, well, we all, we all need to be one and, and we all need to be colorblind and we all need to, and it's like, this is like, God's like, hold on, no, 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 that's not your problem. 
That's not your problem. So let me, let me go into the second story and we'll find out what the problem and what the solution is. Now for the second story, it's the day of Pentecost. And it too is a story about language and unification in language. It's really interesting. The parallels are uncanny. Um, but it seems that just the opposite happens than what happens in the, the Babel story. So the context is this. Jesus had died on the cross and he rose on the third day. He tells his disciples to wait for the promise of empowerment from God. Now, this is really important because he tells them, I don't want you talking or saying anything until we get the culture of your language right, until we're talking about building the right thing and the same thing together and doing it the right way. You know, I mean, he literally tells them, I, I don't want you talking about this. I want you to go and to wait. I don't want you spreading the gospel. I don't want you telling anybody about me yet. You know, because just because you had the same message, just because you've got the same data, the same facts, I don't want you going anywhere. And Jesus doesn't want anyone talking on his behalf until the right kind of cultural language is established. So the day of Pentecost arrives in chapter two of the book of Acts. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues that the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Eliamites and, and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and, and Phlygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. Uh, Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed and saying to one another, what does this mean? But Peter, standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Galilee and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel that in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my flesh, my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on your male servants and your female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Wow, this is a story about language. This is a story about unity, but it is so different than the story about Babel. See, Babel is a group of likes with one language. Pentecost is a barrier-breaking language. I mean, he talks about pouring out his spirit and he talks about the young and the old. He talks about the male and the female. He talks about race. He talks about ethnicity. He talks, talks about the servants, uh, sociological standing, that this was gonna be a language that would break through all barriers. See, Babel is a humanistic pursuit of greatness and fame. And it unifies, creates a language of greatness and fame and comes together and it aligns itself with likes for the same purpose. But Pentecost is a declaration that God's way are the ways that work for all people. So what do we learn from Pentecost? We learn this. Diversity is not the problem, 
motive is. So can I just say to my white brothers and sisters, um, stop saying you're colorblind because that would imply that color is a problem. And we don't believe that, nor does scripture teach that. I would even go one step further that diversity is the model. It's not the problem. I mean, if, if, whenever I try to find something about um, uh, uh, that I don't understand in maybe society or culture or even in my own life, I kind of go backwards towards the image of God and, and back to God himself. And, and God's triune. Now, I don't understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but I know, do know this. We have diversity and we have unity together. And that's called God. So if God is against diversity, why is it seem to be a, a, we have diverse, different persons, but yet in perfect unity? I mean, don't we all agree that in the middle of the day, if you had a choice between looking at the sun in the sky or looking at a rainbow, which is exactly the same light of that sun being refracted by the droplets that are in the atmosphere, and then we begin to see the blues and the purples and the, and the, the reds and the oranges and the yellows, don't we don't we just gasp at the beauty? I mean, you'll be driving down a highway and you'll pull over to the side of the road and you'll, you'll get out and take pictures of an incredible rainbow. Why does it affect us? It's because when we see diversity and unity, it does trump this idea of a, a, um, a homogeneous society, this one society with one language unified with one single purpose. We tend to think that that's the way to get get things done. Well, let me just say, this is the way to build a tower. This is a way to make a name for yourself. But it's not why God has put us on planet Earth, because that does not reflect God himself. So we need to realize that diversity is not the problem. So avoiding it or pretending it's not there, we need to just stop doing. Number two, we need to speak love in another person's language. I think it's incredible that the miracle of Pentecost, it says that each person heard them in their own tongue. See, it wasn't the miracle of translation. It was the miracle of tongues. Um, it's not like they were all hearing it being spoken and, and they were understanding the Jewish tongue. It was like, no, we're hearing in our own tongue. And that really points out to me that, that we need to learn to speak love in another person's tongue in another person's language. I need to learn their culture. I need to understand their culture. I need to speak in their language instead of standing back and I can only say as a, as a, a white baby boomer, standing back and say, well, if they want to be in this country, they need to learn to speak my language. You know? Um, I mean, how obtuse. I mean, I understand there has to be one kind of language that we all speak as a, as a uh, structure for having a society, but, but this idea of speaking in culture, it's like, I need to learn, learn your language. I need to know what you value. I need to know what's important to you. I need to know um, about the language of your life. See, I think we got something wrong as a, as a Pentecostal growing up, and maybe we, we got a little bit off on this, but speaking in tongues is not only a sign. It's a cultural value. See, it needs to be the value that God wants us to have. See, God let people hear love in their language. He empowered the disciples and the followers of Christ, the male and female, slave and, and master, and whatever the social status, whatever the ethnicity is like, listen, no, I'm gonna speak into your language. I'm gonna let you hear love in your language. And I want to empower my church to speak the language of love into culture, into the language of their culture. Not that you come to our church and learn how to speak uh, Christianese or speak Bible Beltish or whatever, whatever it is, the way that we speak in our church, but rather that God let people hear love in their language and God, the miracle was, is that God enabled people to speak love into other people's language. And that's the miracle that America needs right now. It needs the church of God to once again to be empowered by the spirit of God so that we can speak under the power of God with the tongue of God, the language of love to all cultures. That's what they need to hear. Then three, the, the third thing that we need to learn from Pentecost is this, that love, truth, mercy, justice, and compassion, which are the works of God, 
um, need to be for all people. And they need to be our cultural language. Because you know, so, we were like, well, well what's, what's the works of God? What, it says that they were declaring the works of God. Well, we know the works of God are love, mercy, and justice, and compassion, and, and, and truth. And so we need to learn to speak that language because it's the language of God. See, for too long, I have required others to speak my language in order for them to succeed. I was, I was talking to Tim Singleton, and, and I really don't want to sound like a, uh, a stupid white guy, but because um, I'm not a stupid white guy, uh, but he is a black friend of mine, and I know everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah. So, but, but he's been a, a friend of mine for um, well over 25 years. Matter of fact, I think I have to credit him with getting me into mountain biking. Um, but he said this to me, and it was really interesting. A white person does not have to talk to black people to be successful. But a black person, in order to be successful, must talk to white people. And I thought, that is, that is crazy. You know, it blew my mind. You know? And, and, and he said, Paul, that's what I think is the concept of the privileged you are privileged enough to ignore us if you want to. We can't ignore you because we want to succeed and we, we have to learn your language. Um, and he said, you're privileged enough to regulate us, meaning that in order for us to succeed, we have to go through you. We have to speak your language and then we have to make sure that we speak it in a way that you approve of and then you regulate our success or not. Now, I'll tell you what, that blew, blew me away. Now, if you're a dude out there, a white dude, and you're like, well, that's not the case. I know somebody. It's like, okay, come on. Let's, okay, we can all find exceptions to the rule here. But I think that really does. Um, I, I don't have to talk to black people to be successful. I don't even have to talk to black people to do church. You know, I mean, I can just go about my merry business. Um, but it is really interesting in America. Black culture has to learn white language. But here's the thing, that needs to stop because the tongue of God is that we speak love in one another's language, that it is on me to sacrifice my opinion and my way of speaking for the sake of Christ's likeness so that I can speak the language of God into another person's life. Uh, you know, the internet is full of people sharing uh, right wing and left wing pundits, and and they're clever. I mean, th there's all kinds of neat little videos that you can watch that will argue this, and then there's a rebuttal video that comes out and it argues against it, and to show and to persuade people, and and our American culture is just going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, but what about that? Well, well wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. Well, well, well what about that? And we're we're being kind of tossed and to and fro by every kind of wind of doctrine is what the Apostle Paul would say. But can I say this as blunt as possible? Screw the babble, because that's what it is. It's the babbling language of our culture when it's unguided and undirected by the tongue of God. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. Everybody's saying what they think is right. Everybody pulling out their statistics. And the Apostle Paul says this, if I speak in the tongue of angels and have not love, I am just a noisy gong. Wow. Being right or having all the statistics is not going to get it done in America. America will be just an unfinished tower if we don't do this God's way. We're just going to be a nation of free speech that will be equivalent to babbling. Or we can begin, starting with Christianity, starting with us, starting with each of us who follow after Christ, be willing to, to put our self-opinion on the cross and wait, like Jesus told us, for the Holy Spirit to inspire us to speak with the very tongue of God, the language of God, which is love and truth and justice and compassion and mercy. We are supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. 
We are supposed to be a nation that cries out, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. We are supposed to be governed while holding these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. We are supposed to be one nation under God. So today, as Christians, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we tower builders or are we community builders? You know, I, I'm not asking the unbeliever this. I'm not asking the atheist this. Because, you know, as far as I can see, they haven't been given the miraculous power of the tongue of God. But we have got to ask ourselves as churches and as believers, are we tower builders or are we community builders? Are we speaking our opinions or are we speaking forth the word of God in his very works? Will we be willing to crucify our own opinions and go um, nowhere and say nothing until we are speaking with the tongues of God in the language of all people? Are we willing to just stop in the middle of all the babble and just stop and wait for God to speak through us the works of God, the language of God with the very tongue of God? There's so many people we're quoting right now, but for the Christian, we're supposed to be quoting Christ. We're supposed to be quoting God. We're supposed to have this unction of the Holy Spirit within us. It's not enough for us to have just walked with Jesus like the disciples. It's not enough for us to just see Jesus like the disciples. It's not just for us to know Jesus like the, like the disciples. But we must wait to be filled and to ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can speak with the very tongue of God. I, I heard a news reporter talking about the response of the city of Charleston over the last two weeks concerning the protests and some of the riotous vandalism that has taken place. And the commentator said that something must have changed in Charleston since the killing of the nine saints at Mother Emanuel Church. And we all remember that story where the nine were gathered together um, and welcomed in uh, a white young man into their black gathering and invited them to be a part of their Bible study. And in the moment of prayer, while they bowed their heads, he shot each of them, killing them. And as Americans, we watched how, how um, the city of Charleston just responded to it. It was a holy moment. Um, it, everybody thought things were going to bust loose like they were busting loose in Detroit, I'm not in Detroit and in Baltimore and some of the other cities. But, um, but I remember how Charleston responded and the whole world was wowed by it. And so this commentator on the news said, well, the reason why things have changed is probably because uh, black Charlestonians are fed up and now they're acting out. I think he was totally wrong because of a couple things. First one is this. I think black Americans have been long fed up. But I think more than that, I think that the families of the victims and the community of Mother Emanuel Church controlled the narrative. They, by the miraculous power of God, spoke in tongues. They spoke in the tongue of God, in the middle of tragedy, in the middle of hatred of the worst kind, in the middle of suffering and loss, in the middle of a threat of riot. These families, the, this community, this church said, we are not going to speak. We are not going to babble in the language of man, that we are going to speak in the tongue of God in the language of compassion and mercy and justice and truth. And what happened? 
the world literally stood still in awe. On the nightly news, the world was in awe of the tongue of God being spoken through the people of Mother Emmanuel. In this time again, in our culture, for the people of God to speak with the tongue of God, not with the tongue of Republicans or of Democrats, not even with the tongue of whites and blacks, but with the tongue of love and justice and mercy and truth and compassion for everyone. It is time for the opinion of God. This is the Christian freedom of speech. A Christian's freedom of speech is not to be able to give a person a piece of our mind. The law of liberty is subject to the law of love. This is our freedom of speech, to have the tongues of God come forth from our, from our lips and let it be the language of our culture. And this kind of different together can change the world. So as we go into this moment, um, this really does need to be a moment for us to shut up and um, shut up to others and speak to God. It's a time for us to talk to heaven, to talk to God and say, God, I will not speak another word. I will not click a like on another post. I will not post another meme or um, go on to Instagram and, and give my opinion or tweet something out to society. I will shut up to others until I first speak to you and have you speak through your Holy Spirit into my life. And God, this is what I speak to heaven. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Baptize me with your presence. Once again, the church of God needs the miraculous power of God to flow through our hearts and through and out our tongue that we may have the tongue of God and the language of God would be the works of God.